Why, why does time fly like this? We sometimes feel like we're still locked into April and it's already, we, we're moving towards the end of the year. And I have this privilege to share the word with you again this morning. And I thank you for listening to us. And I trust Holy Spirit will do something for both you and I. Last week we spoke about taking responsibility and we saw the amazing date, 1945, the end of World War II. And we saw how Hiroshima was bombed and destroyed, laid flat on the ground. And we saw on the other side of the world in America, a city called Detroit, the biggest industrial trophy of the American industry. And we saw that as this nuclear bomb laid Hiroshima bare, within a few years, those Japanese people had rebuilt. They took responsibility for their city. They rebuilt it into something of a trophy of mankind taking responsibility and then we saw how that after 1945 how this beautiful Detroit went downhill and the people stopped taking responsibility for their city and broken people came back from the war and Detroit was laid bare because of human extraction because of human just failure and this morning I want to carry on and I want to link with last week's message and I want to talk about dreams and desires. What were in the hearts of those Japanese people? What were in the hearts of those people in Detroit? What is in your heart this morning? And behind me, I've got musicians. I know of nobody like a musician that grows up with a dream and a desire and I would also call it needs or urges. And, and, and I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the reality that you and I grow up with vision, with possibilities, and with all sorts of things. And sometimes we don't take responsibility. Sometimes we just trust that somehow my daddy will give me, my daddy's money will give me, or somehow somebody will put something in my lap. But most of us grew up. And as we were growing up, and your children in your home, just make sure, just chat with them, talk with them. What is in their hearts? And I want to take you to the first dream in the Bible. The first dream in the Bible. Genesis chapter 1. The dream, the desire of God. Listen to this. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Then it says in verse 12, the earth produced vegetate, vegetation. For what? See, God's dream was bigger than food. He had an eater in mind, somebody that could consume that food. The earth produced vegetation, seed bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seeds in it according to their kind. God saw that was good. Evening came and morning the third day, and God said, let there be lights. And so it carried on. And then verse 20, God said, let the water swarm with living creatures. God had life for this planet in mind. God had something that would portray the dreams and the urges the, the needs and the desires that were in his heart. And then God blessed the, the, the animals. Then verse 24, God said, Let there be animals according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that crawl, wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And then the biggest dream of all ages. Let us, verse 26, make man like us, in our image and in our likeness. They will rule the fish, the birds, the livestock, the whole earth. They will have dominion and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man, verse 27, in his own image. Listen to this. And he created him in the image of God and he created them male and female. The first dream that we read about in the Bible, the dream 
of our Creator God. And that dream and that desire, that need and that urge included you and me. Can I take you to a little dream of a little insignificant woman that speaks to us of her significance in the grand scheme of God? We're in John chapter 4. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, he left Judea and went to Galilee. Jesus didn't want to be in contention. He didn't want to be in competition with his, with his cousin, with John. And it was in midday, and it was, if you have ever been in Palestine, it's hot. Jesus is thirsty, and he's tired. And he goes, and he sits at Jacob's well. Jesus, worn out from his journey, verse 6, sat down at the well, and it was about noon, it was 12 o'clock. A woman of Samaria, who is Samaria? The Samaritans were not counted as human beings by the Jewish people. The Samaritans were like a, a pushed out community of, of maybe color. They were different to the, to the Hebrew people. And so they, they didn't really mix. The second thing you need to understand about this portion of scripture, a man did not mix with a woman on the street. And a rabbi never mixed with a woman on the street. And so here's Jesus sitting and a woman comes. Just a woman. We never heard, learn her name. And a woman of Samaria, the one of those pushed away people, came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her. Because his disciples had gone down to, to town to buy food. It was lunchtime. She retorts, she says, how is it you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? This is not fitting. She asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Jesus is pushing this thing way beyond physical water, way beyond a natural thirst. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us this well and drank from it himself and his sons and their livestock. And Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up to him in eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. She thinks that she could escape natural uh, desires and natural cravings of the body. <coughs> Excuse me. Call your husband, he told her. Come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You answered correctly, Jesus said. You don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and the man that you now have is not your husband. What you said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Now she's asking him a religious question. Jesus is zooming in on her heart. He's zooming in on her dreams. He's zooming in on her desires, her needs, her urges. And she worries about religion. Where do we worship? Uh, this church, that church. Uh, uh. Jesus told her, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is here when the true worships, worshipers will worship Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am He. This woman had dreams. She had desires. She had urges. She had needs. 
It's just a woman. Yet in this few scriptures, these few verses, God exposes the real need of just a Samaritan woman. Somebody unimportant to us. Somebody totally important to God. Five husbands. And the one she's with now is not her husband. In other words, this woman had desires, had urges, had needs to meet a man that could satisfy the deep longing of her heart. She's now with a sixth man. And suddenly before her stood the seventh man, Yeshua, Jesus. Suddenly the one that could meet all her urges and cravings and desires stood before her. And she didn't know what was happening. And, and he starts exposing her inner deep needs and her inner desires. Six men unable to quench her desires, her deep needs. A seventh man that meets all her needs. She ran to the city and told them, there's this man. And, and everybody from her little town came out. Can I talk to you? As we discover this whole thing about our needs and urges, can I talk to you about twins? Uh, uh, many years ago, there was a film made about Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito, and they were called twins. And I mean, Arnold is like six foot two, Danny DeVito is like five foot, and, and the two were called twins. And, and I want to read the scripture to you. It's in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. Do you have your Bible with me, with you? Just follow me quickly. 1 Corinthians. Ah, this is so powerful. 1 Corinthians 15. Your word is a lamp to my foot, my Lord. Verse 45. Jesus is speaking. Paul is speaking to the Corinthians church. Jesus is speaking through his channel, through his his son, Paul, he says, So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, it doesn't talk about a, a second Adam, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first Adam, a living soul, just a living being. He was breathing, he was pumping blood, he was just living the last Adam became a life-giving spirit these are the twins two Adams first Adam struggled with inferiority after him and Eve disobeyed God he struggled with inferiority he struggled with shame he, he, he felt like he was separated from God there was a distance Adam where are you is the call of God and the call of God still rings out this morning Adam Man, where are you? And then in his, in his separation from God and his broken relationship, this man starts designing religion. He, he, he designs certain clothes to wear. He designs a certain building that we should attend at a certain time to be worshippers of God. And, and in his efforts to, to create this religious experience, he wanted to get back to what he first had in, in the garden when God said, He is good. When he heard God's approval, he wanted to get back there. And, and so man becomes a designer of ladder, religious ladders. What can I do to climb back to God? And, and so this woman is, is, is designing ladders she she tries in in different marriages different relationships to quench the thirst of her heart see first adam is just a living soul first adam's problem is a peach tree bears peaches a pumpkin bears pumpkins orange trees bear oranges first adam becomes a sinner he's his, his, his character is such that he becomes a sinner. And, and Paul describes him in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. He says, this man in his heart, this sinner, has immorality. That's part of his makeup. Impurities. Indecency. 
idolatry, magic. Now the word for magic is pharmacia, which refers to medicines. I will drink a pill to make me feel good. I will drink a pill to make me feel down. I will drink a, 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 a cup of something to make me feel better, to get my dreams more in color. I will, we call it magic. That's medicines that will help man in his struggle to, to retain his position as the image of God. There's enmity in his heart, separation, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, divisions. He has a party spirit. There's envies in his heart. There's murder in his heart. There's drunkenness in his heart. There's carousing, eating too much, carousing. And so these are the, the fruits that this tree bears without God. This is just how I am. No, but I never, I never broke into a building. I never stole anything from anybody. Do you have idols in your life? Uh, are, are you jealous of somebody else's achievements? You see, we are guilty. And then in the Middle Ages, they designed another intermediary. Somebody to stand between God and myself. And I have the picture here of a confessional where, where a man sits in a white robe and a man comes and confesses his struggles to this man in the white robe. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been three weeks since my last confession. These are normally the rhymes that come from their, from their mouths. And then this, this guy in the white robe behind the grid, he says, I forgive you, my son. Go and sin no more. And I don't need Jesus. I have found another intermediary. I have found somebody that can stand between me and my failures and God. And this becomes a huge problem that we want other people. We want a psychologist. We want some tablets. We want some things. We have urges. We have desires. We have cravings. But God has dreams and desires. And if we look at the second partner of this twins, Last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Let me give you some clues. There is absolutely no reference to Jesus' sinful nature. You see, a father's blood determines a child's parenthood. And Jesus was born from a virgin. He was not born from Joseph's blood. He wasn't a, a, a family member of Joseph. Joseph was just a man that, because of shame, married Mary. But Joseph wasn't Jesus' father. You see, Jesus' blood came from his father. So Jesus was from another tribe, from another humanity, a new humanity. 2 Peter 1.4, Peter writes, whereby are given us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these great and exceeding promises, you might be partakers of a divine nature. And Jesus has a divine nature, like Father, like Son. And so, last Adam, Jesus comes to, to usher in a new tribe, a new possibility, with new cravings, with new desires, with new urges. Ephesians 2.12, Paul writes to the Ephesian church, that at that time you were without Christ. He's referring to B.C. and A.D., before Christ and now after Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. He's speaking to people that are not Hebrew people. You were, you were alienated. You were not part of the commonwealth of Israel. Israel was the chosen people. You were strangers from the covenants of promise. You had no hope and you were without God in the world. And, and, and yet there was a craving and a desire to be in the right place with God. But now in Christ, you who sometimes were far off, are brought nigh, you are brought near by the blood of Christ. You see, this blood ushers in a whole new humanity. That's why it couldn't come from a man called Joseph. It came from Father God. He is our peace, this Christ Jesus. He is our peace who has made both one. And have broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished in the flesh the enmity, the, the, the differences, the war. 
even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. It's like the law is fulfilled. I don't have to meet the, the, the uh, requirements of the law to please God anymore. Something new is birthed. Even the law of commandments are contained in the ordinances for to make in himself the two to become one. The two to become one. God has such an earth. God has an urge. He's such a desire that there be no separation between him and you, him and me. This is the plan of God. See 2 Corinthians 5.17 not only is there a new Adam, a lost Adam, but in this lost Adam, there are many sons. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Because of a new humanity, there's the possibility of a new earth. There's a possibility of new music new designs, new technology, these, these unlimited design possibilities in this new man. There's the possibility that you sit this morning with a hunger and an urge. You have a desire deep within you. I try my best. I don't drink. I don't chew. I don't go with the girls that do. And yet there's an emptiness in your heart. Paul says, if I'm in Christ, I'm a new creation. Christ comes by his spirit and he makes me a brand new human being. Listen to what Paul says in verse 18. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself in Christ Jesus. For you that have given your life to Jesus, good news. He's reconciled you in order that you can bring reconciliation to somebody else. A young lady said to Pat this week, she said, Auntie Pat, um, the storms and the, the floods in the Cape, aren't these things indicative of, of the second coming? And you know, for 2,000 years, the church has now seen all sorts of signs for the second coming. In fact, the first church really believed that Jesus would return within their lifetime. And the question is not, is Jesus coming and do we see the signs of his coming? The question is, are you a reconciler? Is your life testifying about the fact that Jesus is in your life? You see, the people you meet, they drive cars and they live in houses and they have all sorts of things that manifest what's going on with the cravings and the desires of their heart. But there's one thing that can quench my thirst. It's the seventh man turning up at the well and giving me something more than earthly water. Something more than meeting my immediate needs. Something more so I could become a life-giving spirit in union with him, a new creation. Let me pray with you this morning. Heavenly Father, you know us. You know what's happening behind the scenes where nobody can see. You know how, what we think when we're alone. You know what we desire, what we crave, the urges that drive us, that compel us sometimes to, to do things, oh God. And in spite of that, you long to share my life with me. Oh, Jesus, I want to ask you in this house, in front of the screen this morning, Holy Spirit, come and heal, oh God. Come and, and create a possibility thinking, a thinking in the person who's listening this morning. To move beyond where he is, where she is at right now. Come and do it for us. As these musicians behind me have dreamt from a very young age. Lord, you know that the deepest craving of our hearts is to be with you. To have you as our Father. To have you cleanse our hearts and our thoughts and our lives. 
Help us this morning, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name.